from Oasis of Faith Christian Center in Hesperia, California. Welcome to the Oasis of Faith with pastor and teacher, Daryl Harrelson. Welcome to the Oasis of Faith. Let's turn in our Bibles, if you would please, to the book of Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, and as you're turning there, if you would please say this after me. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. And I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we're going to continue on in our study. We've been teaching on the subject of developing a winning attitude. Say a winning attitude. Winning attitude. Now last week we looked in Hebrews chapter 11 and we looked at what we referred to as the hall of fame of faith and we looked at these individuals and their, what they faced, each one of them, and how they came out victorious. And the Bible says all these that were in faith, they didn't, during their time, they didn't receive the promise as per se. But you and I are under a new covenant now, right. a better covenant, a covenant established on better promises, and God is here today to make sure that we receive our promises. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. Now, it's amazing that God focuses in on the successfulness and victories of our lives more than our, our failures. And that's something that we need to do if we're going to have the right attitude. Amen? Yeah. So then we must, what must we do to create this winning attitude? We must strip off the things that slow us down. Now, we looked also in Hebrews where Paul said to lay aside every weight and sin that would so easily beset us or hold us back. Amen? Yeah. So we've got to get rid of those things, strip those things off, and then begin to focus. Now, listen. Begin to focus on the goals of God's best for you and for your life. Does anybody here this morning, do you have any goals in your life? Okay. Begin to focus on those goals and the best for your life. Say the best. The best. The best. The goals. You got goals? Yep. I know you do. Focus on those goals and the best for your life. Not, don't, don't settle for second best. Amen. Don't settle for less than what God has for you. Amen. And I'm here to tell you this morning, he's got a lot in store for us. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. So in doing so, we're going to work on this area and we're going to look today, I'm going to, we're, going to, we're going to talk a little bit about the power of a godly attitude. Everybody say a godly attitude. Oh, okay. A godly attitude is a position now in relationship to the power of God, now listen to, what, listen to how I'm going to say this. A godly attitude is your position in relationship to the power of God and His Word in your life. Mm -hmm. The more word, the better attitude. Amen. The less word, not so good attitude. <clears throat> Are you with me? Amen. Now, once again, I want to read you the definition of the word attitude. I told you I was going to read it in, in every session, and I'm going to because I want to keep it fresh in your mind. Webster's Dictionary defines the word attitude as a settled way of thinking or feeling about someone or something, typically one that is reflected in a person's behavior, a position of the body proper to or implying an action or mental state, the behavior... A person either in uh, the behavior of a person either in a good or positive manner or a resentful and antagonistic manner. So notice, I like the first part of that. It is a settled way of thinking. An attitude is a settled way of thinking. And this is where a lot of Christians get in trouble because one day they think positively, the next day they think negatively. And that will mess with your attitude. It will. And this is why it's good. Negative thoughts try to come. Now listen to how I'm going to say this. 
negative thoughts try to come to all of us. You ready for this? Every day. Every day. If you're married, negative thoughts will come to your marriage. If you're single, negative thoughts will come to being single. If you're a Christian, negative thoughts will try to come to you even as a Christian. I guarantee you since you've been in church, since you came through the building this morning, since you walked in, you've had some negative thoughts since you've been here. Am I telling the truth? You've had some negative thoughts already. Why? Your mind is under attack of the enemy. And the question you have to ask yourself is, do I let the enemy have control of my thoughts, or do I cast down those thoughts, and do I work and develop a winning winning attitude? And like I said, we're going to look at a godly attitude this morning, because a godly attitude will get you into a winning attitude. Amen. Amen? So I said this, a godly attitude is, now listen, this is, this is powerful. A godly attitude is your position, not anybody else's position, your position. In relationship to the power of God, what, what, is, what is your position when it comes to the power of God and the word of God in your life? Why? Because that's going to determine your attitude. And that's why I said the more word, the better attitude. Less word, less attitude. People that I've known over the years who spend a lot of time in the word and praying and seeking God, it seems to me they have a better attitude than those that just play games all the time with God. No, I'm, I'm being honest. People that just hit and miss, never read their Bible, never study, never pray, they, don't, they never have an attitude of someone who spends time with God. Why? They have developed a godly, and they're, and they're still developing, a godly attitude. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. Amen. So, we're going to talk about this for a few moments. Is that all right? Yeah. But your personal attitude, if you're taking notes, write this down. Your personal attitude comes from your innermost dominant strengths. Therefore, your actions are largely governed by those inner natural tendencies. Your dominant inner strength will create an attitude toward people or information that will bring a response without even thinking about it. See, if you're a positive person, you'll just be positive. Huh? If you're a friendly person, you'll just be friendly. See, you don't have to stop and think, do I, do, am I supposed to be nice to this person or, or can I be ugly? No, if that's your attitude, then you're going to be nice to everybody. Amen. So now write this down. A bad attitude comes from dwelling on wrong information or responding from bad input. A good attitude can be created by dwelling on the kind of things that produce right responses. Can we read those again? All right. A bad attitude comes from dwelling on the wrong information on wrong information or responding from bad input. Do you know you can listen to someone say something negatively and it'll affect your attitude? Uh-huh. But if you listen to someone who says something positive, yeah. it'll, it'll affect your, your attitude in, in just the opposite way. A good attitude can be created by dwelling on the kind of things that produce right responses. Okay? So now, I had you turn to Isaiah 40. Are you there? Yes. Isaiah chapter 40. Now, you all know this verse, but let's look at it. Verse 31. Isaiah says here, by the, by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, but they who wait upon the Lord. Now, I want to deal with that just for a moment. They who wait upon the Lord. Now, you've heard me teach on this verse before, but it bears repetition because a lot of times when we look at the word wait, people naturally think waiting means doing nothing. Mm-hmm. You with me? Yeah. I've, I've talked to people. What are you doing? Well, I'm waiting on the Lord. Well, waiting on the Lord doesn't mean you sit down and do nothing. Waiting on the Lord implies that you're doing something. Just like when you go to a restaurant and you sit down, all things being equal, there's either a waiter or a waitress that attends you. 
What do, what do they do? They're waiting on you. Am I right? So that means that they're there to serve you. They're going to minister to you. Now, it may be food, but they're going to, regardless, they're the ones that are going to go place your order. They're going to bring it out. They're going to win them. Well, on the way things are changing now in restaurants, you know. But because now somebody takes your order and somebody else brings it out. And nobody gives a rip on how, how everything turned out. But it used to be the waiter or the waitress would come out. They'd take your order. They'd bring it out. And then they would check on you occasionally to see, is everything okay? Am I right? That's what a waiter or waitress does. So when Isaiah says here, they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, it's talking about those who are not just sitting down doing nothing, but they are actually waiting on God. They're serving God. They're about the Father's business, as Jesus said. They're doing something. They're praying, they're studying, they're reading their Bible, they're attending church, they're paying their tithes, giving offerings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we can make a whole list of things that we do. Now, I didn't say any of that stuff will save you. I didn't say that because there's only one thing that will save you, and that's just receiving Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. We've been teaching in the book of Romans on Wednesday night, and I said this, I believe I said it Wednesday night. And a lot of people don't, don't grasp hold of this and they don't understand but if you're here this morning, you know, and, and, and you haven't been in our, our Bible studies on Wednesday night, I want you to grab hold of this because the Lord showed something to me that really, and Pastor Ennis is going to help you too, because, you know, with all the grace stuff that's been going on that we've been talking about, there is nothing you can do to get saved. There's no works. Paul tells us that in the book of Romans. We are only saved by grace through faith. You can't receive the grace of God without the faith of God. God gives you the faith to receive his grace. The grace of God is God's unmerited favor. All that simply means is it's God's willingness to work on your behalf to do things on your behalf and to help you Amen. without you even asking for it or deserving it. Amen. That's the grace of God. But a lot of this grace teaching that's going on right now, they talk about, well, the Lord knows you're going to mess up. The Lord, the Lord knows you're going to sin, so you might as well just go ahead and do it and then get forgiveness for it. It's what they call, now they're calling it a hyper grace teaching. I had the Lord say this to me. You ready for this? I think it's going to help you. He said, grace, I love it. Grace, I got to, help me, Lord, bring it back in my remembrance. Grace does not give you the ability to sin. Grace gives you the ability to live above sin. Did you get that? When I heard that in my spirit, it went off like a rocket. Grace doesn't give you the ability to, to sin. It gives the, you the ability to live above the sin. I like that. So when you hear some of these grace teachers talking about, yeah, you can just, well, you know, God knows you're going to do it. God already knows you're going to do it. So just go ahead and do it and then just get forgiveness and go on. That's not the way God works. Years ago, we used to call that flaunting the grace of God. Yeah. But God's given us the ability to live above that. Yeah. When you can live above the ability to sin, then you'll have a good attitude. You'll have a winning attitude. This will help create a winning attitude. Amen. Yeah. But he says here in Isaiah 40, verse 31, But they who wait upon the Lord, so now we're waiting on the Lord, we're serving him. They shall renew their strength. Remember, your strength comes from the Lord. Amen. But just like anything else, like how many of you have a driver's license this morning? Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, you have to renew your driver's license. Yeah. Isn't that right? Amen. Every once in a while. I know this year I have to renew mine. He says the same thing applies here to your strength. What's he implying? He's implying that our strength can wane. Our strength can weaken a little bit. And he said, those who wait upon the Lord will keep their strength renewed. Amen. 
In other words, if we could say it this way, they'll keep their strength recharged. Yeah. They'll keep that battery. Just before, sir, I didn't know what Jerry was out of the sound booth for, but when he walked up here during the greeting time, I said, um, did, did you want something, Jerry? And he handed me two batteries. Well, I thought I checked the batteries when I came out for my mic, and I thought they were fine. But sure enough, they were dead. So I was just, as the old saying is, I was running on fumes. Didn't know it. But he put two brand new batteries in my mic, and here we go. You understand what I'm saying? Why? Because my batteries had to be renewed. Your battery, your spiritual battery, needs to be renewed if you're going to have a winning attitude. Amen. You with me? He said, but they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Now, I didn't bring my little wing, my uh, eagle information out today. Some of you have heard that before, right? What happens in, a, in, a, in an eagle's life? And maybe I'll bring it out one day. I don't know. But it tells a story in the history of an eagle and how they operate and why they fly so high and why they do what they do. And their feathers fall off and they knock their beaks off. Eventually, they knock their beaks off because they grow new beaks. And that's how they operate. That's how they function. And they live for a long, long time. And they're one of the strongest birds that God has created. But I like this part here. He says, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. You see, eagles are one of the, are one of the birds. That I, if I'm not mistaken, now don't hold me to this, but I think I'm right. They, are, they fly higher than any other bird in God's creation. Am I right? Yeah. Have you heard that? Uh -huh. I may be wrong, but I'm almost 99.9% .9 sure. They fly higher than any other bird. Well, I've said this before, that this verse tells us that we can mount up with wings as eagles. Well, what's he saying here? We can soar above the trials and tests of life. Amen. We can get above the situations of life. Yeah. We can rise above them. Yeah. Why? Because we're renewing our strength. Amen. And in doing this, renewing our strength, we're developing a winning attitude. Yeah. But you will never soar with eagles when you run with turkeys. That's right. That's right. Did you get that? That's right. All, no, I'm just telling you the truth. You want to soar like an eagle, you got to hang around eagles. That's right. That's right. You keep running with turkeys, guess what? All they're going to do, you're going to be going around going gobble, gobble, gobble. That's all you're going to do. And you may end up on somebody's Thanksgiving table. No, I'm telling the truth. But if you want to soar then you got to, he said, wait upon the Lord. They shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run. Notice, notice this. They shall run and not be weary. They won't grow tired. They shall walk and not faint. They won't run out of gas. You hear? So the power of God is, or the power rather, the power of God is a godly attitude. So when you begin to look at this verse, that power of God's word that we're seeing right here will allow you to take control of your attitude. You ready? All right, say this after me. I can. I can. Say, I can. I can. Take control, take control of, my of my attitude. Now, when you begin to do that, here's what's going to happen. It will help you obtain and possess a godly attitude. See? I can run and not grow weary. I can walk and not faint. And remember we looked at the scripture where David said, I can run through a troop and leap over a wall? Yep. Remember that? Mm -hmm. We can't. Why? Because that's a, that's a winning attitude. But a winning attitude is developed as we seek the Lord and as we do what Isaiah 40, 31 says. They who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. I don't know, but this ought to make... Some of you this morning just, just want to just get home and just get into the Word and just get along with God. I love, I was, I was getting ready yesterday, yesterday morning for prosperity class, and I got here early, and uh, Brother Frosty came walking in, and I didn't, I didn't even hear him walk in, but I was in my praise time, wasn't I, Frosty? I was just in my, I, I have to spend time every day with just me and the Lord in praise Amen. and worship. Besides my prayer time and my devotion time and my reading time and my studying time, I, I have to have my personal praise time Amen. where I just worship and sing praises to him and love on him. Amen. And really, when you do this, 
the quickest way, because the Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people, that's the quickest way to get God to show up right in the middle of your circumstance when things are happening around you. When all hell breaks loose, just drop what you're doing right there and just begin to praise and thank God. Amen. Not for the situation, not for the problem, but just begin to praise him and thank him. For who he is, for what he's done. Think about what he's done in your life. Sometimes you may have to go back and, and think about, hey, you know what? I remember when he brought me out of this. I remember when he blessed me here. I remember when he healed my body here. And you begin to think about those things. You'll praise him with that. And then as you begin to worship him, you're not asking him for anything. You're just simply worshiping him for who he is. Because he's God. That's what true worship is. is just worshiping for who he is. You don't have to ask him for anything. Amen? So, the power is a godly attitude. Now, I want us to look at something here. Because in doing this, it means that we're going to have to maybe change some attitudes or an attitude that we've had in the past and not go back to it. Because we're creating a winning attitude. A winning attitude is a godly attitude. Go to uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, real quick. Matthew chapter 4, and let's look at verse 17. Matthew 4, verse 17. Now I'm going to read this to you first from the King James Version, and then I'm going to look at it from Ben Campbell Johnson's translation. And I'm going to show you what I like his translation because it deals with what we're talking about. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, it says, From the time Jesus began to preach and to say, now notice what he says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, we've taught you in this church that to repent doesn't mean to just ask for forgiveness, but repent means to turn away and do, uh, I want to say this right, do a 180 of what you're doing, right? So if you're going this way and you make a change, you turn around and start going the other way, okay? So repenting means to change. Change what? Change what you were doing to what you're going to do now. You with me? All right. So he says, from the time Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, change and turn. Now listen to what Ben Campbell Johnson says. I like this translation. Jesus said, change your attitude. But he didn't stop. Change your attitude and actions because an invasion of the Holy Spirit is imminent or close at hand and near approaching. Did you catch that? I like that. An invasion of the Holy Spirit. How many of you be, how many of you are ready to be invaded by the Holy Ghost? I'm ready. Huh? But notice how he said it. Change your attitude and actions because of an invasion of the Holy Spirit is imminent. In other words, it's on its way. It's coming. See, the world doesn't understand this yet. The church ought to. But the world doesn't understand this, but the Holy Spirit is getting ready to move mightily in our midst. Amen. We're getting ready to see changes come about, not only in our own personal lives, but in our government, yeah. in our finances, in our physical bodies. We're getting ready to see some, some changes. And so in order to see these changes come to pass, we've got we've to change our attitude. See, we say we want, we want to see a move of the Spirit, but the Holy Spirit can't move until we change our attitudes. Amen. What do you mean? we got to have an attitude of winning. Amen. We can't let a, a, a hellish, devilish attitude hold us back any longer. Amen. We, we can't allow that to happen any longer. We've got to grab hold, as they, as they said in the Old Testament, we've got to, got to grab hold of the horns of the altar. Amen. Grab hold. And don't let go. In other words, get a hold of God and don't let loose. Amen. Because right now, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. There are people who don't have a hold on God. And they need to grab a hold of him. 
No, really, they need to get hold of God and just, I mean, no matter what it costs, don't let go. Just get a hold of God and whatever happens, don't let go. We were talking yesterday and uh, we had made, I made a statement or we were, we were talking about some things about the economy and how, it's, how things are getting ready. And things are getting ready to change. But I was, uh, I might have shared it with Dean. I had heard something, or maybe we heard, we heard, I heard it somewhere, and all I did was, I would just repeated it, was all. Mm -hmm. But they were talking about, uh, maybe I read, it was an article I read, but they were talking about Walmart. Oh, I know, it was an article I read on the internet about major companies right now that are, getting, that are going under. Uh, they're closing down, like Bed Bath & Beyond. I was, okay, I, I was shocked. And then Best Buy was another one. They're having financial difficulties. But one that just shocked me was Walmart. And I thought, Walmart? Sam, Sam Walton's dream was to run Kmart out of business. That was his only competition. And he did. But Walmart is all over the place. You go everywhere. It's, all, it's almost in every town. And then I, I heard that they were shutting down, they were literally shutting down stores in Washington and Oregon. Right. Shutting them down. Yeah. And then Richard, Richard shared with me that he had heard and come to find out that before COVID, Walmart was either shipping or receiving nearly 400 trucks a day into their warehouse, into warehouses? Into their warehouses. 400 trucks a day, a day or a week? It was a day. A day. 400 trucks a day. Wow. That was before COVID. Mm -hmm. During COVID, it dropped to 300 trucks a day. Mm -hmm. And now, and I'm not pointing any fingers, because if I do, people get offended. And here again, I'm not going to point fingers because I have to pray for our president. Mm -hmm. You may not like him, but you've got to pray for him. Now they're down to 45 trucks a day. Now that's a big drop. 45 trucks a day instead of over 400 a day. Now that's a lot. Now, what's happening? We're getting ready to see a move of the Spirit of God. I believe we're getting ready to see the greatest wealth transfer that the world has ever seen. No, I really believe that. Now, what is our assignment to do during this time? Our assignment right now is to develop a winning attitude and to stay in God's word, stay in God's good graces. And the thing we don't want to do is fear. What's going to happen is going to happen. You're only one individual and you're not going to change it. But our responsibility is to pray. You see what I'm saying? It's our responsibility, it's all of our responsibility to pray for our nation, pray for our leaders, pray for the economy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But regardless of what happens, God can and will take care of his people. That's why I don't like to preach fear and, you know, and, and gloom and doom or anything like that. We know If you read the Bible, you, you, you read the Bible is not gloom and doom, but it tells you about things that are going to happen. So why does God tell us about these things that are going to happen? So we can prepare. I call it, you remember, that, remember during 2000 when we were ready to go from 1999 to 2000? You remember the Y2K scare? You remember that? I called it the Y2K scare or prepare. All God is telling us to do is get ready for it, prepare for it. He told the children of Israel how to prepare. And so he's telling the church today, just be prepared. Why? Because things are going to change. But in order for things to change, we must change our attitudes as well. Into what? What we are doing right now with our attitude into a winning attitude. Amen. Say winning attitude. winning attitude. Now, too many times, everybody wants to put everything over on God, but God's waiting on us. Amen. Well, God will do it. Yeah, God will do it, but he uses people. And he always has. He's always used people. All right? So... Here he says, this is why I like this, change your attitude and actions because an invasion of the Holy Spirit is imminent. We're talking about creating a godly attitude. See, the Spirit of God has invaded this natural world as we know it with his power and his love. 
But there's getting ready to, we're getting ready to see another move of the Holy Spirit. We, I was talking with someone the other day about, uh, about Azusa Street, the outpouring of the uh, Holy Spirit in Azusa Street. And a matter of fact, uh, does anybody remember what year? Was it 1909 that it happened? Early 19, do you remember Sister Carolyn? 1906? Okay. Then, uh, but I remember in 2000, 2006, uh, at Crenshaw Christian Center, Dr. Price and their church, they actually had a 100-year anniversary celebration of the Azusa out street, out, uh, pouring of, uh, Azusa street outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They had a 100-year anniversary, and it was a powerful meeting. I was there. And, um, but I believe we're getting ready to see another outpouring of the Holy Spirit in these last days. Amen. And this outpouring is not going to be per se for the church, but it's going to be for the world. Right. God's giving them one last chance to come into the kingdom of God. And they're going to see signs and wonders and miracles by the church. Yes. See, God's prepared us and is preparing us to be witnesses to the lost world. Amen. And when that, when that happens, the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the greatest harvest that we've seen in our time, then when that happens... I believe the church age is coming to an end and Jesus is taking us out of here and then all hell will break loose during that seven-year tribulation Amen. period. That's what I believe. Amen. But there's a reason why this outpouring is going to happen. Now, how long are we going to be around? I don't know. Year, two years, three years, five years, I don't know. But regardless, there's going to be another outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So what's he doing? He's preparing us to receive. We've already got his grace, his love, and his power, but now he's going to begin to use that and, and manifest it through us to the world. Because right now the world has no respect for the church. Can I just say this? The church doesn't have any respect for the church. And, and, and I, can I just be honest with you? A lot of it, a lot of it that we see in the church has been brought on by itself. We see the world making fun of ministers. I don't like it. No, I don't like it when I see worldly pe people making fun of ministers that I like. Okay? I don't like it when they make fun of ministers that I don't particularly care for. But regardless, they don't have a right to do that. Even though some of them act goofy, I don't think anybody has a right to make fun of a man or woman of God. They don't have a right to do that. Amen. But they do. And the church, the church is, 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 is I mean, I've said this before. If Jesus walked through the door right now, the church would crucify him again. They would do it again. Because by and large, the majority of the church world really doesn't believe the Bible. That's right. That's right. But this is where we come in and we've got to help people understand and believe what the Word says. I believe this Bible. Amen. Things that are written in this Bible, they're going to come to pass. Amen. Regardless. Amen? Amen? So you can embrace that invading force and become a part of God's plan to influence this generation, which I believe is the last generation. And your attitude, when it comes to winning, it determines how much of this invasion of the Holy Spirit is going to work inside of you. Grab hold of that. That's powerful. So now we as believers, we must develop this attitude that will truly cause us to win. What am I trying to do here? I'm trying to get you to create an attitude and develop an attitude of winning. Say, I'm a winner. I'm a winner. Say, not only am I a winner, I only win. I don't lose. And because I win, I'm a winner. I'm creating an attitude of winning. So I win. Now, we're in church right now, so everybody, hey, praise God, hallelujah. But in just a few moments, when you walk out these doors, you're going to face the real world again. That's right. So you came to church, as it were, and you got your fix. But it's going to be up to you as to whether or not you keep that fix or you let it wear off. And that's where a lot of people get in trouble. Yeah. No, I, I, had a, I knew a minister one time, or... A guy in his church told him, he said, you preachers ain't nothing, he says, but a Sunday fixer. He said, you just give people their, their weekly fix. Well, you fool, you only knew. I'm not here to give anybody a weekly fix. I'm here to help you get into the word of God 
know who you are, understand who you are, and operate in the things of God that he has for you. Amen. Amen. So, this is why we must, say I must. I must. We must always see ourselves in the light of the promises of God's word for us now and for the future. For now and the future. All right? All right, now let's deal with a bad attitude or a wrong attitude. Can we do that just for a moment? We look, now, we, we looked at the, a godly attitude. But let's look at a wrong attitude. I want to show you someone in the Bible who had a wrong attitude. Go to Psalm 77. Now, Psalm 77 is a clear picture of the kind of change that can happen with your attitude if you'll allow it. Asaph, who was one of David's chief musicians, he actually wrote this particular psalm, Psalm 77. And he begins with some very common and confusing ideas about the troubles that he faced. And this, the church, you can literally put yourself in this position and see the attitude that he had. Because we can relate to it. Okay? Did you find Psalm 77? All right, I want to look at verse 1. He said, I cried unto God. Now listen to what he says. I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. In the day of my trouble, has anybody ever faced trouble? Yeah. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My soul ran in the night. In other words, my hand was stretched out all night long. And ceased not, my soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. I remembered God and I was troubled. Mm -hmm. I complained. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. And my spirit was overwhelmed. Selah. <clears throat> now the word selah means to stop and meditate and think about what you've just heard and think about what you just read. Pay some attention to it. Don't just, don't just Read it superficially and just go on to the next verse. But stop and meditate. Take some time to think about what he's saying here. He said, I cried unto God with my voice, even with, unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. In other words, he heard me. And in the day of trouble, I sought the Lord. I was seeking the Lord. My sore ran in the night, or my hand was stretched out all night, and ceased not. I didn't quit. My soul refused to be comforted. Notice it was his soul. What is his soul? His mind, will, and emotions. Mm -hmm. He said it refused to be comforted. I remembered God and I was troubled. I hope you don't get troubled when you think of God. When you remember God, I hope you don't get troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. So what's Asaph saying here? He's saying in the time of trouble, I did the right thing and I sought the Lord... I did that, but I refused comfort. In the time of trouble, when you seek the Lord, God wants to comfort you. He said, I sought the Lord, but I refused the comfort and was further troubled. And then he thought about God, said he remembered God. He remembered God. Even though he sought the Lord. He, now watch this. He, he sought the Lord, but he complained. Mm -hmm. Do you know Christians who seek the Lord and still complain? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he said, and because I complained, he said, I became overwhelmed. Amen. This is a wrong attitude. Mm -hmm. We can learn from this. So how do we remember God and end up being troubled? Possibly, possibly now, by thinking all that he has done for others. You ready? I've, I've seen this in church all my, all my Christian life. By thinking of what he's done for others and wondering, why hasn't he done it for me? Oh, I've been to church. I've been to church. And, and I've been around Christians in church. And, and, and this, all, this, this happens and why it happens, I do not know. All I know is I was never going to be a part of it. I, I just refused to engage in it. But I would see people in church who got blessed. 
I was always happy for them. But there's always somebody in church saying, well, why does it always happen to them? How come it never happens to me? Or how come this? Why, why this? How come God always blesses them? How come I've seen people in church complain about true ministers of God? Well, why does God do this? And why, well, why don't you do what they're doing? Amen. That's right. That's right. Don't get jealous of it. Don't complain about it. Amen. Well, I just don't think it's right. We'll start doing what they're doing. Amen. But see, they don't want to do what they're doing. They'd rather complain about it. Amen. Right. Amen. And, I, and, I, and I've shared this with you before. In, even in my wife and our, in our own personal families, we've had family members that come to us and say, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't serve God the way you do, but we know the God you serve, he blesses you. Yeah? So we're wondering maybe if you could bless us or help us out because your God has blessed you so much. I said, wait a minute. No, I stopped them right in their tracks. Wait a minute. You don't want to serve the God I serve, right. but you want to serve the God you want to serve. But my God is blessing me, and your God's not blessing you. But you want me to take what my God blesses me with and give it to you? Correct. I'm going to be like Elijah. Let your God bless you. That's right. That's right. That's right. Let your God bless you. No, really. Now, that offends people. But, and they, and no, this literally was told to us. Your God. That's how they said it. Your God. Your God. Well, you can serve my God. That's right. He won't turn you away. But you don't want to serve my God. You want to serve your God. Mm -hmm. And you want to wear the badge of Christianity. Right. Say you're a Christian, mm -hmm. but you don't believe in the blessings of God. You don't believe in healing. You don't believe in prosperity. You don't believe. And I go down the list. You don't believe. But then you want me to take what God has blessed me with and give it to you. But yet you don't want to serve my God. Right. That's hard for me to grasp hold of. And I'm not against blessing people. But once I bless somebody, I want to see if their life changes. Because if you think you're going to continually live off me and not serve God, you got, you got another thing coming. Not doing it. I remember Dr. Price telling the story years ago. There was a person who came into one of their meetings, and after the service, he, he walked up to Dr. Price, and he said, Dr. Price, I'm from Australia. And he said, uh, the Lord told me to come to the United States, to come to Los Angeles, to come to Crenshaw Christian Center, and to talk to you. And Dr. Price said, okay, go ahead, talk. He said, well, he said, the Lord told me that when I got here, and I did what I had to do, that you would give me the money to get home. You ever hear that story? And uh, Dr. Price said, isn't that amazing? He said, I just have one question. How come God didn't tell me? If God told you all that, how come God didn't tell me? Isn't that amazing? Like I said, there's nothing wrong with blessing people. But you, you better make sure you're blessing it as you're led by the Spirit of God. Yeah. Amen? Mm -hmm. Now, how did I get on that? Uh -huh. Talking about attitude. Wrong attitude, right? So Asaph now, he, he's troubled. He's complained. It's overwhelmed him. Why? He had a wrong perspective. Say wrong perspective. Wrong. Wrong perspective. He had a wrong perspective, and it was costing him his help and his peace from God. Mm -hmm. God wants to help us. He's here for us. However, do you remember, you remember God? Talking about Asaph now. He remembered God. How do you remember God, Asaph, and end up in more trouble? Possibly by thinking what he's done for others. Asaph's thoughts and complaints about God left him in a state of being overwhelmed. He was overwhelmed. So now, write this down. The prescription to becoming overwhelmed is this. I'm going to write you the prescription from the word here. This is how he became overwhelmed. This is how you can become overwhelmed. Face your troubles. Face your problems. Focus on those problems. Talk about them. Tell everybody about your problems. You with me? 
think the wrong thoughts about God, and then begin to murmur and complain. And I promise you, you will become overwhelmed. This is a wrong attitude. Now drop down to verse 7 because his wrong thinking continues. He says, will the Lord cast off forever? This is a question. And will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Does his promise fail forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has his anger shut up his tender mercies? Selah. Think about it for a moment again. Think about these questions. These are all questions Asaph had. These were all the questions. Asaph was completely confused about God. Let me add this. There are a lot of Christians who are confused about God. Yeah. One day God blesses them, the next day God makes them sick. Are you, are you with me? One day God blesses them, the next day God takes everything from them. God blessed me with a new job, the next thing you know, he took it away from me. God blessed me with money, next thing you know, now I'm broke. He gave it to me, he took it away. No, no, no. Job said the Lord gave and the Lord take away. It wasn't God who took it away. God blesses, but the devil, your adversary, is waiting to steal what God blesses you with. God gave me a husband, he took him away. God gave me a wife and then he took her away. No, God doesn't do that. The devil's the taker. He's the one who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Not God. God's on your side. He's trying to help you. But you know what I've noticed? This is just me. I've noticed that sometimes when people get blessed and God blesses them supernaturally, that they receive the blessing and then they just sit down and wallow in the blessing and then they forget about God. That's dangerous. You got to remember where your help comes from. Huh? I can remember this because th th there's been times in my personal life where I've had to, things weren't going the way I wanted. And I said, I told my wife, I said, I'll be back. She said, where are you going? I said, I got to get along with God. And I'll be gone for the whole day. I, I, I like to just get away, just get in my, my, my truck and just take off and go driving. Mm -hmm. And just talk to the Lord. So pull over on the side of the road and just talk to the Lord. Maybe sit there for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, whatever, and just talk to the Lord. And I'm not saying praying where I go, I go, Lord, thou knowest my problems. Thou knowest the situation that I'm in. Please look down from heaven. No, I just sit there and I talk to the Lord like I'm talking to you. Lord, here I am. You told me to come boldly to the throne of grace. I'm not coming religiously. I'm not coming King Jamesy. I'm coming from my heart. And I'm talking to you from my heart. And Lord, I need, I need some help here. I need some answers here. Show me what I need to do. Show me how I need to make a change. Show me what, what you want me to do. Show me what I've got to do. to. I, what, notice this. What, I'm not asking you to change the situation. Show me how to get out of this situation. Tell me what I have to do to get out of this situation. Because evidently I got me in that situation. God didn't put me there. I did it. Okay, I'm the only one. I'm the only one that messed up and got put myself in a situation. This is where Asaph's at. Will the Lord cast off forever? See, he's completely confused. And these six questions that we just read here, they seem to summarize every kind of misconception and position of what the Bible refers to as unbelief. Now, let's look at a good attitude or a right attitude. Can we look at that for a moment? All right. Because many people face troubles today with the same attitude of unbelief because they're really not familiar with God as he's revealed himself to them in the Word. If you want God to reveal himself to you, get in the Word. Spend time in the Word. Now, let's look how, how God answers these questions to Asaph. Number one, will the Lord cast off forever? If you take a notes, write these down. You don't have to turn there because I'm running out of time, but write these verses down and you can, as I read these questions, I'll give you the verse. Will the Lord cast off forever? John 6, 37, Jesus said, All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and him who comes to me I will in no wise cast out. Now, I realize Asaph didn't have the New Testament. Jesus hadn't come yet, but we do. 
We have it. We have the answers. Will the Lord cast off? Jesus said, I'll never cast you out. The next question he asks is, will he be favorable no more? Proverbs 8.5 says, for whosoever finds, watch this, whoever finds me, the Lord says, finds what? Life. If you find the Lord, you find life. And shall obtain favor of the Lord. Proverbs 12.2 says, a good man obtains favor of the Lord, but a man of wicked devices will he condemn. The third question he asked, has his mercy ceased forever? Psalm 89, 28 says, my mercy yes. will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. You, See, we've got the word for this. Yes. These are all the answers to a Asaph's questions here. Yes. Psalm 136 makes this statement, his mercy endures forever. Yes. Watch this. 26 times in the same psalm. His mercy endures forever. The fourth question he asks is, is, has his promise failed forever? Well, 1 Kings 8.56 says, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people, Israel. According to all that he promised, there has not failed one word of all his good promise, yeah. which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant. Yeah. See, this is what Solomon had to say about the Lord. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. But again, in Psalm 89, 34, he says, My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. When God speaks something, he keeps his word. That's See, that's why it's so important. You know, and, and I've said this before, but it bears repetition. One of the reasons why it's, it's hard for some Christians to take God at his word and just believe it and trust it, do you know why it is? Because their word is no good. If their word is no good, then they think God's word is no good. So therefore, they can't trust it. But when your word is good and you do everything in your power, I didn't say we're perfect. But you do everything you know to do to make your word right, yeah. huh? Then God will make sure His word is right in your life. Yeah. It's called integrity. Yeah. The fifth question: Has God forgotten to be gracious? Psalm eighty four eleven says, "For the Lord God is a sun and shield; the Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will He withhold from them who walk uprightly." God's not withholding anything from us. No, 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 no. See, we're getting to attitude now. Asaph's attitude was wrong. We're getting back to right thinking now. The last question, the sixth question Asaph asks. Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Psalm 117.2 says, if you're writing it down, for his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise ye the Lord. Each one of these questions now that ASAP proposed have been answered from the Word of God. All we have to do is take these questions where they try to come to us and apply this word that we've heard. You hear what I'm saying? Each of these questions point to God. Now what? listen very carefully. They point to God as the source of your troubles and your problems. Each one of these questions he asks. Each of these questions do not make one reference to the possibility of Asaph needing to change anything. He didn't say, Lord, I'll change. Show me where I messed up. I'll change it, Lord. Tell me, show me what I can do to get out of this mess. He never said that. All he wanted to do was question God. And that's where a lot of Christians are. Too many times they want to question God. Why, 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 why? Well, why, why, why? I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Why, 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 why? Next thing you do, you got to call the ambulance. Because all they want to do is whine. So my question is this. Do you think maybe, maybe we need to change the way we think in order to get right, the right attitude of winning that God desires for us to have? Yeah. You think maybe that's a possibility? Yeah. I think so. And see, that's why Romans, and we'll close, Romans chapter 12 says, 
I like what, go ahead, turn there real quick. Romans chapter 12. I got, I got, I got just a minute. Romans chapter 12. This is a powerful what the Apostle Paul says. Now we know it. We can probably quote it, but let's look at it. I like it when we look at it. Romans 12, verse 1. Paul says, I beseech you, or I beg, or I plead with you. Therefore, brethren, he's talking to the church at Rome, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable or spiritual service. And be not conformed to this world, and be not conformed to this world, and be not conformed to this world. I'm, I'm going to drive this home. I'm going to keep hitting it like a, you would take a hammer and a nail. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Now he tells us how, how we're transformed. By the renewing. How do we change our minds? How do we change our attitudes? By the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind. How do you renew the mind? With the word of God. That you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That's how we do it. We renew our mind with the word. When those thoughts, negative thoughts come, you can't dwell on those negative thoughts. You've got to cast them. Paul said, cast those imaginations down. Cast those thoughts down. Cast those reasonings down. Cast them down. Why? Don't give them any place. Why? Because if you meditate on them long enough, then you'll start partaking in them. You'll start doing it. Remember, the, thought, the thoughts are going to come. They come to all of us. But what do we do with the thoughts? Cast them down. Don't meditate on them. Let them go. Amen? Did you get anything out of that this morning? Yeah. We trust this message has been a blessing to you. The announcer will give you more information how you can obtain an audio or video of the message you've just heard. Remember also that these broadcasts are made possible by the continued free will offerings of viewers, of the you, the viewers, and listeners. Remember also, God loves you, we love you, and Jesus is Lord. We trust that this message has been a blessing to you. If you would like to receive a copy of the message you have just heard, or if you would like more information about how you can receive a brochure with the list of all of Pastor Harrelson's teachings, then please call or write us. Our address is 17250 Lemon Street in Hesperia, California, 92345. Or you can call the ministry at area code 760-948-0745. Once again, our address is 17250 Lemon Street in Hesperia, California, 92345. Or you can call the ministry at area code 760-948-0745. Pastor Harrelson would like to invite you to come and join us in a live worship service. If you are visiting in or if you live in the high desert area, then please make plans now to be with us. Our address and times of services are on the screen. Remember that these television broadcasts are made possible by the continued free will offerings of you, the viewers and listeners. Remember, God loves you, we love you, and Jesus is Lord.